Okay, so hi everybody. Um, we are going to have Niharika go on next and she'll be speaking about congestion aware routing for multi-class vehicles. Um, if you have connectivity issues, please feel free to watch the video in a separate tab, but do leave your hope in session open so that you can come back here for live Q&A. So we'll get started. Okay, third time to chat. Hello, everyone. I am Niharika Shrivastav, and thank you for joining us today. Today, I am going to talk about how we can potentially predict a traffic jam by providing congestion-aware routes to every passenger in the network and basically avoid situations like these. Well, for a little background, the problem of congestion arises because every passenger inherently opts for the shortest distance route from their source to destination. So with an increase in the number of vehicles on the road over the years and with capacities of roads being approximately constant, this results in increased travel times and road blockages on intersections in the network. This also results in underutilization of a city's intricately built road network. Well, I would like to introduce a concept called multi-class fleets, which also serves as a major crux in our framework for implementing congestion-aware routing for an entire system. So the concept of multi-class fleets allow breaking a customer trip in three classes. We have the first mile, middle mile, and the last mile. The first and the last mile can use micro-mobility options, such as walking, e-scooters, and bikes. And the middle mile uses fast speed vehicles, such as cars, private taxis, or even public transports like buses. So the middle mile is used to cover at least 90% of an entire customer trip. And the usage of this is that by using a multi-class setup like this in an optimal combination, a customer, customer can easily maneuver through crowded paths and decrease their overall travel time. So allows a customer flexible options for their preferred mode of transport um, on the basis of accessibility and cost. So for example, a customer starts walking from their source for about 250 meters, and then they take a bus for about 15 minutes, uh, after which they bike away to their destination for 500 meters, thereby completing their entire trip in three phases. Well, so let us uh, formulate our problem in a more defined way. We essentially have to route customer trips in a congestion-aware manner using this previously explained multi-class fleet of vehicles. And we also want to provide optimal transit points for each trip. Now, what this means is that if you look at this figure, let's say a person wants to go from A to B and they have two possible route options, A, C, B and A, D, B. Well, they can walk to their nearest bus station at C and then take a bus from C to B, having their total trip time as 34 minutes, maybe because this bus station is really popular uh, because it is closer to A. Or they could have walked a little bit further to their next nearest bus station at D and then take a bus from D to B, having their total trip time as 30 minutes, thereby saving four minutes of overall travel time. So you see that in this network, the optimal for, uh, path from A to B is A, D, B, and the optimal transit point is B and not C. Transit point means that it is a point wherein we stop taking one mode of transport and start taking another. So in this case, we have stopped walking as for our first mile, and we have started taking a bus for our middle mile. We also want to implement this entire network in the form of a social model. So the current state of the art basically uses congestion, provides congestion aware routes to just one customer. And that is not a social model. It 
it implements a user selfish or user centric method so for an example let's say you are checking google maps to look for a route to your destination which is absolutely congestion free but while you are checking for a route so are about 100 other people and you all decide on the same route which shows as congestion free but when you actually take that route the 100 other people also decide to take the same route simultaneously with you creating a traffic jam on that route and which will increase your overall uh, travel time for every passenger in the trip so this congestion of air route that was provided wasn't in real time and wasn't for the entire system. We want to create this framework and scale it to the entire system, by, thereby creating a system equilibrium, uh, which incorporates every person in the network's request. So let me introduce another concept called Geographic Information System or GIS. What that is, that GIS is basically a computer software that helps us to extract and analyze geographic elements for research purposes. So as you have guessed already, transportation analysis comes under GIS. There are various open source libraries in Python that help us to, that help us to analyze this just information for our research work. So the first library that I have used is actually called OSMNX. What that does is that OSMNX helps us to retrieve network uh, street networks from the OpenStreetMap database and then further analyze our uh, and further analyze elements of it using other libraries. So one thing to note is that this entire framework was validated using Singapore Street Network. And we therefore extracted Singapore Street Network from OpenStreetMap using OSMNX. Over here, we see that these are all the nodes in the Singapore uh, graph and this is the edge or all of the edges in Singapore graph. So OSMNX helps us to retrieve networks which are tagged either only for driving or maybe just pedestrian networks or which are only used for bicycles. We uh, This graph actually is only a drivable network because we are calculating congestion for roads which can only be drive, uh, drived upon. The different colors show if an edge is either a primary road or a highway or a residential road and so on. The next library that we are using is called GeoPandas and it is actually an extension of the data science library Pandas. What it does is that it helps us to visualize the previously shown nodes and edges in form of data frames. So you have one data frame for nodes and one data frame for edges. So over here, I have shown a, an edge data frame for the previously shown edge graph. So you can see that, let's say, you and me refer to the starting and ending nodes for an edge. He represents uh, which lane it is. So it is possible that in complex road networks such as of cities or countries, there could be multiple lanes within two nodes. So if key is zero, that means it's the first lane between uh, the edge nodes U and V. OSM ID is just a primary ID needed to understand this entire row for the data frame. Name specifies the name of that particular edge. So in this case, Tampines Avenue 8 is the actual name of this edge in Singapore. Highway shows whether this road is either a primary road, a tertiary road, a residential road, etc. Maximum speed specifies the speed limit that is allowed for any vehicle to go on that road. And this is decided upon government regulations. Length is in meters and travel time refers to free flow time. That is the travel time required to go through this edge UV when there are absolutely no vehicles present on that road. So that is free flow time. And location uh, consists of your latitude and longitude points of that particular edge. So 
Now you have your data frames of nodes and edges separately. You can combine them to actually make a graph for further analysis. And this is done by a library called Network X. So Network X combines these two data frames, creates a graph, G, consisting of edges and nodes, and helps us to um, implement algorithms such as the shortest distance route uh, like Dijkstra or Bellman Ford or just other analysis like nearest neighbor search and so on. And the last but not the least, uh, we are using R3. So R3 is actually a spatial indexing library. What it does is that it basically creates a rectangle on every geographical element on the map and then by either create, uh, using set operations like intersection or union you can find neighboring elements for one sort of element so you could for example find the nearest node or nearest or all the neighboring nodes for a certain node given a certain radius all right so Let's start with actually implementing this congestion or wear out uh, ruling framework. What are we actually doing? Well, the first and foremost step is to extract data. And the first kind of data that we are extracting is network data. So we use OpenStreetMaps database, like explained before, using all these GIST libraries, and we extract and manipulate and process the data we extract only drivable uh, drivable networks road a road network because we want to calculate congestion on that and we also extract road networks that use pedestrian networks as well because we are trying to incorporate a multi class setup the next kind of data that we are going to collect is actually called a traffic speed band data set and it looks something like this what is happening is that traffic speed band data set is something that is available by singapore's government it is freely available it shows real-time average observed speed at a certain edge for every edge in the singapore's graph so in this case you see that link id refers to the OSM ID for which it is the OSM ID of the particular edge and then you have the latitude and longitude position for that particular edge and over here this is the speed band so the maximum observed speed was 39 whereas the minimum observed speed was 30 so this speed band data set is actually a snapshot of how speeds were observed at a particular point in time and using this, we can actually calculate congestion for the entire network. Well, okay, all right. So how we do that, we will come to that later. But after we calculated congestion for the entire network, we have to we, we, we propose an algorithm. And what this algorithm's main aim is that it should minimize the overall travel time for one user in the entire network and our constraints would obviously remain transit points for that user at what point should this person start taking a bus and stop walking etc to reach their destination after we have minimized travel time for one user, we want to minimize overall travel time for every user in the system. So this is achieved by actually formulating a linear programming problem, wherein our cost function is to minimize the overall system's travel time, and our constraints become uh, you know, constant road capacities and continuity in the network. So after we have proposed these and all our, all our mathematical tools are in place, we use our above proposed algorithm to actually find optimal transit points for the middle mile. After we found that, we solve this linear programming problem to find transit points for every person in the network. And we solve this linear programming problem by using a conditional gradient descent algorithm called Frank Wolf, which is specifically used for transportation based problem statements. And 
after we have found you know system optimal flows flows which for the entire network these flows are basically um ensuring that there is zero congestion at all times we want to decompose these flows into dedicated routes for every passenger in the network so that they can just freely go on that route without having to worry about congestion at all okay so after we've done all of that awesome magic our final architecture looks something like this so let's say there are n customers at one point asking for uh, re requesting source destination trips, you know, different source destination trips. What they our framework helps us to calculate middle mile transit modes for all of these end requests using this algorithm that we propose, and it's called modified hybrid search, which we will come to later. After we have calculated the middle mile transit modes for all end requests, we use our conditional gradient descent and decompose these flows into dedicated routes for every customer in the network and something to note sorry something to note is that these nodes follow a multi-class setup where every customer would be using a combination of these vehicles so let us actually start with implementation. How are we calculating congestion? We use a heuristic called the Bureau of Public Roads Heuristic or BPR in short. And what it does is that it tries to estimate the travel time required to go through an edge UV in the graph. So, okay, inherent, you know, intuitively speaking, if your available road capacity is less, that means the number of vehicles on the road are more, and that means your travel time to cross that road would be more. So that means you're facing more congestion and traffic jam if your number of vehicles on the road are more, right? Uh, is more. So in this equation you can see that tduv is actually the estimated travel time to cross an edge uv and tuv refers to free flow time for uv so what again to reiterate it means that it is time that would take a person to cross u and v given that there are no roads on the uh, no vehicles on the road at all and using this equation, alpha, beta constants, F refers to the number of vehicles on the road at that point and capacity, uh, C belongs to capacity of that road. So you can see that if number of vehicles on the road are more for on an edge UV, the estimated travel time would be really, really high. All right, so after we've computed congestion for the entire network, using this heuristic, we are going to compute our middle mile transit modes. Well, okay, to put it in a very graphical way, an entire customer trip could be seen in this manner. X and Y become our source and destination, and A and B become our transit points for the middle mile. So basically, we a, a person would be walking or using micro mobility options from X to A as their first mile then taking a vehicle from A to B as their middle mile, and then taking another vehicle or just walking again from B to Y as their last mile. So X and Y are set. We only need to find A and B, which happen to be our optimal transit points for the middle mile. How this is done is actually very simple and very intuitive. So let's say this is a source and the person wants to go to their destination. We first take a radius of 500 meters. So total it's like 500 plus 500 up to one kilometer radius for the, uh, from the person and their destination. And we check what are possible nodes within this radius that a person can walk to and then take a middle mile vehicle from this node to, to cover the rest of their desk, rest of their desk, uh, journey right so a person could walk to either a b or c and then take a middle mile vehicle to either d e or f and after reaching 
any of these points, they would further walk from D, E, or F to their destination and complete their entire journey. So already we are trying to implement a multi-class fleet setup. So you can see that a person has about three into three, nine combinations of possible routes to take. And that route is selected, which will result in the least overall travel time from source to destination, right? So that means A and F have to be selected in a way which will be optimal and provide minimum travel time from source to destination. So how A and F are calculated uh, is actually done by an algorithm that we proposed and it's called modified hybrid search. So, all right. Now, this is in this graph, you see that there is a point x1, y1, and there is another point x2, y2. And the blue line actually corresponds to a Euclidean distance, which is actually just a straight line drawn. And then the red line corresponds to the actual path that has to be taken to, to go from this point to this point. So you see, theoretically speaking, Euclidean distances serve as a lower bound for every distance. And if we try to just translate distances to time, just by uh, dividing it by constant speed, so Euclidean times are again serving as a lower bound for a path which has, uh, you know, a path having the actual distance from X, from A to B. All right, so over here, what you see is that this array is a Euclidean array. Now, what that means is that, let's take an example just to understand all of this easier. Uh, in the previous example, we saw that there were nine possible routes. In this case, let's say there were 10 possible routes for the person to go from their source to destination. So in their array, our we have Euclidean distances calculated for all the 10 possible source destination pairs, and they are then sorted in increasing order of their length. Now, again, if I divided all of them with their, with a constant speed, they would become time. So in this case, these are Euclidean times sorted in increasing order. And ideally, if I want to find a, a, a source destination pair having the shortest distance or shortest travel time, I would have to go through all these 10 uh, elements and check which is the which is my minimum pair and then output it. But that is not that that is not optimal at all, because n could be really huge. So therefore, we are trying to modify the search and try to return early and in turn also provide an optimal answer. All right, so after we have this Euclidean time sorted, which is serving as our lower bound, what we do is we define a cutoff, which is equal to C of n by E. E is base of log logarithmic. So which is equal to fourth element. 10 by E is approximately the fourth element. And then we have a decider, which is equal to cutoff plus one or the fifth element. Now, the significance of this cutoff is that after we have searched till our cutoff, we are going to stop our search and return whatever answer we have gotten till now, whether it is optimal or not. We will assume that that answer that we got is optimal. If till cutoff we haven't received an answer, then we will compare with decider and return our answer. Okay. Now, this cutoff was selected using a concept which was used in a problem called secret hiring secretary problem, which you can read about further. It basically um, it basically claims that a person, I mean, sorry, after the stopping criteria of n by e, there is always a thirty seven percent of win guaranteed. All right, so we're going to see how this works out for us. So let's say what we do is that we go to our first element, which has a Euclidean time of 10 units. And we open up that element and we see that the actual travel time is 29 units. 
Now this 29 units is greater than its next Euclidean unit, which is 20. So that means, so then we try to open the second element, which is 25. Now we see that 25 is lesser than 29. So till now, our minimum pair happens to be 25. We also see that 25 is lesser than its next Euclidean element, which is 30. And we know that Euclidean distances or travel time serve as the lower bound. That means 25 is bound to be the lowest element in all of these 10 elements. So we have found our optimal transit points and it's time to return. That's it. In case two, we do the same thing and we open up the first element. In this case, we see that the actual travel time is 35 units. It's greater than the next Euclidean unit. So we open the second element, which is, which is 32 units. Till now, 32 has been our minimum because it's lesser than 35. So it's a minimum pair till now, but 32 is still greater than its next Euclidean unit. So we have to open up the third element as well. It happens to be 45. So our 32 units is still the minimum pair and 45 is still greater than the fourth. So we open that up, which is 55. Moving on, we have 65. So we have reached the cutoff. 65 happens to be our decider. So now we have to stop at our cutoff. We see 32 is still lesser than our decider. Therefore, we return our minimum pair to be as 32. And we stop our search. In case there could be a, an alternate case wherein we are continuously opening up our uh, elements and we reach our decider again and we see that in this case actually our decider was lesser than the minimum pair we had till now so in this case we would return the decider because that has been the minimum up till now so this way we see that in either of the cases, we haven't searched all 10 elements. We have returned a minimum pair um, before uh, up till a certain cutoff. And something to note of interest is that this has basically helped us to reduce our number of queries, which translates to that there has been um, computational efficiency in all these three cases. So in the first case, there has been an 80% reduction in the number of queries. And in these two cases, there has been about 50% reduction in the number of queries. So we've gotten an answer about that much percentage. Uh, we've gotten an answer that much faster. So I pr we proposed this algorithm, but is it even any good? So we did a number of numerical experiments just to see how it is actually scaling up to our actual Singapore's network data. Well, the first numerical experiment we did was to compare different kinds of searches. So blue represents a modified hybrid search that we just explained. Um, orange represents a search, which is actually hybrid search, which was, uh, which is a primitive method of the search approach we're using now and green represents our optimal exhaustive search wherein you are going to search through every element to find your minimum pair and you see that we found our optimal minimum pair in the least amount of queries for our modified hybrid search so in all three cases okay sorry something to note over here is that congestion and traffic jams depend on times so in singapore uh, we basically took three slices of time to incorporate different congestion patterns throughout the day so that we can validate that our framework doesn't only work when it's high peak or off peak so we have off peak as 12 a.m or midnight we have moderately peak, which is 3 p.m. when it is lunch. And then we have high peak, which is 6 p.m. when people are finally starting to go to their office, uh, sorry, come back to their homes from their offices. So it's a rush hour. So in all these three cases, we see that the number of queries required to get a minimum 
uh, optimal transit point has been the least using our modified hybrid search. And there has been an average reduction of 70.07% queries. And then with, with a negligible average delay of just 4.67 seconds. So what this means is that let's say an algorithm or a framework would tell you that the estimated travel time from A to B was 30 minutes. Our framework would tell you that the estimated travel time from A to B is 30.467 minutes, uh, 34.67 second uh, minutes. So you see that that kind of delay is absolutely negligible for a use case like transportation. The second proof has been that we tried to um, compare two kinds of framework. Our framework is using a multi-class fleet, which is that it's trying to use three kinds of uh, sorry two kinds of you know it, it's trying to break a customer trip into three classes and routing using congestion aware paths in a system equilibrium way and we are comparing it against a framework which uses just a single vehicle from source to destination in a very user-centric approach which is what we all do generally we take we tend to take the shortest distance route using just one vehicle from our source to destination. So in this graph, we see that there has been um, about 74.26% of waiting queue size reduction. So what this basically means is that there has been an increase in the network utilization by 74.26% by using our framework. It means that you can... So, uh, these many percentage people could be uh, more people could be given or allotted a congestion free path as opposed to your user equilibrium. And all of these people in the network face zero congestion at all times because these congestion aware because all of these routes allotted were being allotted in a congestion aware fashion. And well, the third proof is that, well, if we calculate the overall travel time of the entire system into the number of vehicles that were actually present on the road at that time, which basically means a flow time cost, it is simply number of vehicles into hours travel time. So for all three peaks, we see again that our blue blue framework, as opposed to a single class user equilibrium framework, is uh, performs better than this orange one. There is a reduction of twelve point one three percent in overall average flow cost. So this basically translates to that in a system. Um, there is a reduction of 33 minutes per trip. So let's say on an average, if a person takes one hour to go from A to B, on an average, a person would be, uh, there would be a reduction of 33 minutes per trip for every request in the network. So all of these numerical experiments show how powerful our framework is just by increasing um, the time taken, uh, just by increasing the time taken by walking or using pedestrian networks, uh, which most of us do not, uh, do not use because we're kind of lazy or we just want ease. So, Okay, now this is actually our framework being used against a real life example. So we have used state of the art, which is Google Maps. And we see that let's say a person wants to go from this red spot to this destination over here. So Google Maps actually gives us the brown path, which is on the right over here. It says that there is a total trip time of 53 minutes 
from your start to destination, which also incorporates walking. So this also is recommending you a multi-class setup, but it says that it involves about 21 minutes of total walking, including first and last mile, which is like 10 minutes here and 11 minutes here. And then the rest is middle mile, uh, having their total to time is 53 minutes. And then the, the path on the left is our framework in pink, which says that you have to walk for a total time of 33 minutes, which is like 15 minutes here, approximately 15 minutes here. And the pink part is middle mile, having your overall trip time from start to finish is 45 minutes. So there has been a reduction in the overall travel time by just increasing your time in walking or bicycling by just a little more, by just a little more minutes. So there, so this is us trying to explain how our framework is working against state of the art, because it is also trying, it is not only trying to reduce um, one user's overall trip time, it is trying to reduce every person's trip time by analyzing congestion throughout the network. And so we are at the end of our presentation and we have been able to achieve congestion aware routes in a system optimal way for our entire framework. So let's summarize just in case. We first start by extracting all of our data using Python's open source GIS libraries. And then we try to implement our algorithm by finding possible nodes that we could walk, walk to or, or cycle to, to after, after which we could take middle mile vehicles and then complete our trip. So, so this incorporates a multi-class setup. We find these optimal transit points using a, pro a proposed algorithm called modified hybrid search, which is fast and absolutely uh, computationally efficient than state of the art by about 70%. Um, and there is always a reduction in queries uh, and, and there is absolute network utilization and overall trip time uh, and travel time is also reduced. And we finally have this architecture in place which helps a system optimal congestion aware routing for every customer in the network. So, well, all these are the list of references that were used to make this framework a reality, and we gained inspiration from all of these. And well, that is all. And thank you for listening to me. And I hope you all learned something and had fun in this journey with me. Thank you.